Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Great, great. Well, welcome. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you here to the 2009 World AIDS Day uh, Leading Voice in Public Health Lecture, and I think we have a, a real, uh, a really educational <coughs> and interesting topic uh, to discuss tonight. Um, and I'll introduce the speaker in a moment. Though I want to say, by way of introduction, uh, some of you know that in my career I've worked on AIDS issues in various capacities. And one of the things I noticed is that over time there are certain names that you start to hear over and over again. People who are internationally recognized as the authority in their area. Uh, you all will, some of you will remember last year our World AIDS Day speaker was Jim Curran, who is one of the names of people who is widely regarded as one of the premier HIV epidemiologists. And our very first World AIDS Day, uh, our very first leading voices in public health speaker uh, was Dr. Renslow Shearer, regarded as one of the premier <coughs> HIV clinicians in the United States. And tonight we're very fortunate to have the person who is regarded almost without question as the authority in public-private partnerships as it comes to HIV AIDS. Uh, public-private partnerships, as you'll learn, are the bringing together of the private sector, government, nonprofit, community resources towards a common goal. It makes a lot of sense and it's something you hear about all the time, but the reality is it's really difficult to have an effective public-private partnership. And really the first effective one in AIDS was the African Comprehensive HIV AIDS Partnership, which brought together the Gates Foundation, the pharmaceutical company Merck, and the government of Botswana, and it became the premier treatment program in Sub-Saharan Africa. And Dr. Distelrath was the Merck representative that made that happen. Now there's a new public-private partnership called it a Partnership for an HIV Free Generation, and once again, Dr. Distelrath is a global executive director for that. Someone who has proven that they can bring all disparate parties together towards a common goal, the public-private partnership for AIDS. Part of her success, no doubt, is her academic preparation. For those of you that are in the College of Public Health, you'll be pleased to know that she has a PhD in environmental health. Um, part of her success is her ability to operate at the highest levels of government and the private sector. And of course, the main reason for her success is she's someone who cares greatly about making a real difference in the <coughs> HIV pandemic. So please join me in welcoming a true leading voice in public health, Dr. Linda, D D Linda Distelrath. <laughs> Thank you, Randy, and good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming out on a rather um, uh, bad evening, weather-wise. Uh, it's great to be back here at the university. I think it was two years, uh, two years ago, um, also gave the, the World AIDS Day lecture. And as Randy noted, um, it was primarily focused on the partnership in Botswana. And, um, and just looking at recent uh, statistics that have come out about the AIDS epidemic uh, from UNAIDS and other organizations, I was really so pleased to see that, uh, uh, you know, looking at access to AIDS treatment around the world, um, that Botswana, with now 80% coverage uh, with antiretrovirals for people living with AIDS in Botswana, there has now been, that has attributed to uh, a 50% decline in AIDS-related mortality in Botswana over the past five years. Um, so that was just really gratifying to see, um, you know, the continued uh, results of the work uh, that uh, has gone on for now almost 10 years. Uh, but today I'm here to address now HIV prevention uh, because it certainly is clear that we cannot treat our way out of the global AIDS pandemic by, by treatment alone. Uh, for every three people on treatment, another five are infected. And um, it not only is a, um, a, 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 a poor public health strategy just to rely on treatment to tackle an infectious disease, uh, but it's also quite frankly, not affordable in the long term uh, to just continue to rely on treatment as a means of addressing uh, the epidemic. Um, before uh, uh, you know, moving on, I, also, I need to make a disclosure on, uh, for CME accreditation for this lecture today. I'm not going to talk about any particular drugs or product from a, a commercial company. Uh, and also, um, uh, as far as financial disclosures, um, I do have a financial disclosure because one of the partners uh, in this uh, uh, partnership for an HIV-free generation 
is the uh, company that I'm actually working for, uh, ABCO Worldwide, a global consulting firm in communications and public affairs, and so I am employed by them. And it's through that uh, role that I'm serving as the global executive director for this partnership for an HIV-free generation. HIV-free generation is, you know, is uh, aimed toward the possibility of it truly achieving a generation free of HIV. And I like to think about putting this in context of a youth in sub-Saharan Africa, here a young girl. So we look at you know, possibility of seeing Jane, a 15-year-old girl uh, from the Makuru slum, her settlement in Nairobi, Kenya. And she wakes up and turns on her favorite radio station and listens to a talk show that's the buzz among all her friends because it dares to discuss HIV AIDS issues that her parents neglect. She later takes a matatu, or a small minibus, which has edgy, eye-catching posters with slogans and messages that resonate with girls about HIV AIDS and health issues important to her. And she looks out the bus windows and sees hip billboards enforcing that same message. And she buys a magazine and finds intriguing HIV prevention messages that talk her language and her life situation. And as she approaches her friend, Jane gets a text message on her phone and screams that the HIV partnership has just announced new local music stars will be performing this coming Saturday. Jane gets home, she turns on her favorite reality show produced by the HIV partnership that discusses HIV risk behavior. As they watch together and for the first time ever, her dad invites her to talk about protecting herself and making sure she has a healthy future. She decides that she should know her HIV status. And this is what the partnership is about to achieve an HIV-free generation focused on youth in sub-Saharan Africa. It is about the possibility of HIV-free generation, and to achieve that, it is all about youth. The approach is to target youth, and to target them specifically, where they are and where they want to be, and who they are and who they want to be. And to use private sector resources the tools, technology, assets, the core competencies of business and large organizations that can reach youth very effectively and capture, capture their, their attention and maintain that attention. Before turning more, though, to the Partnership for an HIV-Free Generation, I'd like to just address a little bit about the global AIDS pandemic um, and um, uh, in, in, in honor and recognition of World AIDS Day, which is celebrated tomorrow. You all know that HIV causes AIDS, and uh, you know, as a biochemist myself uh, and a medical technologist, I'm always intrigued by, as I call this, viral beauty of HIV, uh, but also know what a human beast it is. And you think about the last 8, 10, 15 years, the progress that we've made to figure out how HIV works, to develop drugs that inhibit replication, inhibit the protein, uh, protein synthesis and packaging of the HIV particles, um, to prevent HIV from um, entering into another you know, immune system cell. But clearly more work continues to be done, uh, needs to be done on developing new drugs because as you know, HIV can very rapidly become resistant to the current drugs, what, uh, uh, even those in combination. Um, and of course, the, so the search for an HIV vaccine continues to be as elusive as ever. We all know the modes of transmission of HIV. And you know, basically, it's contact or exchange of bodily fluids, whether it's semen, vaginal fluids, or breast milk. And breast milk is certainly one way for mother-to-child transmission, but also you know, the unborn child can, uh, can acquire HIV from the mother you know, through pregnancy and through the trauma of childbirth. You get HIV from transfusion of infected blood and organs by sharing dirty needles, um, which is a very effective way for injection drug users to share HIV among themselves, and through the reuse of unsterilized invasive medical equipment. And I think it was just over this past year there was a case of um, unsterilized endoscope that had been associated with transmission of HIV. And of course there's accidental occupational exposure with healthcare workers with needle sticks or with exposure to massive amounts of HIV-infected blood. Last week, uh, UNAIDS came out with updated statistics on the global AIDS, um, HIV pandemic. Uh, today, there are 33.4 million people living with HIV AIDS around the world. 
about 2.7 million uh, have, have 2.7 new infections occurred um, uh, in 2008, and about 2 million died. And most of those infections in the world are still in sub-Saharan Africa. So it's World AIDS Day tomorrow. What's going to happen? There will be over 7,400 new HIV infections tomorrow. Over 90% 90 per, 90 of those will be in low or middle income countries. 1,000 of those new infections will be children under 15 years of age, and that's primarily uh, children infected through mother-child transmission. And of the newly infected adults, 50% will be women. In sub-Saharan Africa, 60% will be women. And half, nearly half of those will be young adults aged 15 to 24. What are the drivers of the HIV pandemic? I think a key fundamental driver is that knowledge does not translate into behavior change. You could do a lot of surveys to show knowledge of HIV, how to protect oneself from HIV, the ABCs of abstinence, be faithful, use condoms, um, but that still does not drive effective behavior change to really protect oneself. There's cultural norms and values and traditional beliefs and practices. Uh, and that's partic often particularly affects young girls, whether they're kept out of school and kept out of educational opportunities or are subjected to uh, practices that take them at greater risk. There are structural barriers, not enough health care facilities, not enough social services, and importantly, not enough linking all of that together. Um, and those people at risk of HIV also need to have access to family planning. They also need to have access for screening for other sexually transmitted diseases. There are gender inequities, um, and the girls and women disproportionately affected, uh, and particularly with their often subservient status to men in society. And then there are economic realities uh, that too often drive young people and adults, men and women, into transactional sex for cash uh, and to drug use and drug sales, uh, which provides for income that they can't get any other way. The global response to the epidemic over the last five and eight years has actually been quite extraordinary. When you look over the last 20 years, and funding that's been available for the global AIDS pandemic has increased from less than $1 million in 1986 to now $10 billion and still growing uh, here in 2007-2008 timeframe. And during this time, there's been key milestones that have driven funding, driven attention, and has driven political will and government commitment to address HIV in various countries. Starting with the establishment of UNAIDS in 1995, the infusions of funds from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation beginning in 1999 and 2000, the World Bank starting its multi-country AIDS program. And then in 2001, the UN Special Assembly um, on AIDS I've got countries to commit to uh, trying to achieve targets for their country on HIV prevention, uh, treatment, and care. The Global Fund started about 2002, now putting in billions and billions of dollars into um, addressing not only HIV AIDS, but TB and malaria as well. And then in 2003, the start of a major um, US uh, funding uh, for the global AIDS pandemic through the program is called PEPFAR that I'll note in the next couple slides. When you look at total funding by country around the world in, in providing donor funding for the HIV um, global pandemic, the U.S. by far is the single largest uh, contributor uh, to global AIDS funding um, in 2007, amounting to nearly $4 billion. And most of that has now come through the program that was put in place by President Bush in 2003 that was called the, the President's um, Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, or PEPFAR. And this is a program that really brought together in a coordinated fashion through the Office of the Global AIDS Coordinator under the State Department uh, to not only increase money, but to um, have a mechanism to oversee the distribution of funds and the use of funds for HIV prevention, care, treatment, and support and at that time, it was 15 targeted countries, mostly in sub-Saharan Africa. PEPFAR funding has grown from the time of 2003-2004, when President Bush first initiated the program of $2.3 billion. Um, Congress reauthorized the PEPFAR program in 2008. Um, President Obama has endorsed the continued funding of PEPFAR that for, for fiscal year uh, 2010. 
um, nearly 6.6 .6 billion U.S. dollars will now go toward international AIDS relief. The PEPFAR 10-year program goals were to provide treatment for 3 million people, uh, antiretroviral treatment, that number has already reached 2 million, uh, to prevent 12 million new infections, and to provide care for 12 million people living with AIDS, and particularly with orphans and vulnerable children. Now I'd like to move to prevention. As I mentioned, we need to address prevention because we can't treat our way out of the epidemic and the epidemic continues to get ahead of us with new infections uh, every day. Recently, there was a meeting in Tanzania that brought together experts um, uh, around the world. The meeting was organized by the World Health Organization to specifically address HIV prevention in youth and what needed to be done. And there's now a new prevention mindset, we'd say, against, uh, among all the players that are involved in HIV prevention around the world. First on policymakers, uh, and policymakers have been called upon to support and facilitate stronger partnerships and collaborations because no one entity, whether no, no matter how large the government is, can do it alone. But it also has to continue to drive the political leadership and government commitment that is needed to have a sustained response, a sustained response that is not totally dependent on international funding. The countries need to, to you know, step up and take, and take charge and take control of the direction of their epidemic. For the implementers on the ground in the design and implementation of programs, implementers have been urged now. We know in many cases what can work for HIV prevention, evidence-based practices. These implementers need to know what they are and implement, and not only implement, but scale and measure and evaluate how effective you know, these interventions do work in practice. And also to think structurally. HIV prevention is not a standalone program. People and young people at risk for HIV need not only information about HIV, but they need information about family planning, about sexuality, about risk of other sexually uh, transmitted diseases. Researchers need to identify uh, and better quantify risk determinants for HIV, uh, particularly as it affects males versus females and ages uh, along the way. And more operations research needs to be done on HIV prevention, not only to demonstrate effective interventions, but also to determine the cost effectiveness. Uh, there are actually very few HIV interventions that have gone through a rigorous cost, uh, cost effectiveness evaluation, uh, as has been done for biomedical interventions, on, uh, particularly for treatment. And of all, the, of all the possible interventions for HIV prevention, we need to know not only what works, but what's going to be the best value for investment that's made. And for donors. Donors need to support government priorities. I think for too long, donors have gone in, whether it's you know, international governments or foundations or corporations that feel that they are doing a good thing, but they're separate, setting up separate siloed programs that are not connected to anything else in the government uh, or on the ground or not, not clearly tied into the priorities of the government. And that is really a recipe for failure over the long term for sustainability. Donors also need to put more of their efforts on youth programming for HIV prevention. And finally, donors are encouraged not only to support expansion of what the best practices are, but to actually help support the work to test what could, could potentially be best practices. A new emerging approach to HIV prevention is combination prevention. We learned about combination treatment for AIDS through combination therapies of various antiretroviral drugs that need to be tailored to the individual depending on their stage of their, uh, their HIV disease, other confounding factors, and other confounding diseases. Likewise, there is now a call for combination prevention, and it particularly applies to youth. So to, to put together a package of interventions that represent highly active HIV prevention will require the, a selection of a set of prevention, inter, uh, prevention interventions that will be sp specific for um, an individual, specific for youth, and can be selected from a, a menu of items and interventions available, whether it's behavior change, biomedical strategies, uh, treatment for uh, uh, sexually transmitted diseases, 
providing for economic opportunities for young people that will, get, that will help reduce their risk of HIV if they are you know, traditionally using transactional sex for cash, um, as well as addressing some of the social uh, justice and human rights issues, and particularly gender inequities. So what are some of the menus of, uh, the menus of options? And if you look at the categories of, of HIV prevention, you can look at the broad categories of biomedical interventions, behavior change interventions, and structural interventions. There are many things that we know works, man, many things that we have a pretty good idea they probably are going to work, although the, the rigorous data to prove that may not, be, may, not be, um, uh, it may not exist. Biomedical interventions are many, whether it's post-exposure prophylaxis for, uh, with antiretrovirals for rape victims, or um, uh, health workers who have been exposed in the hospital setting. Certainly prevention of mother-to-child transmission. Um, actually, recent data has just come out. Uh, now nearly about 45% of HIV-infected mothers now have access to antiretrovirals to prevent, um, to prevent transmission. Uh, but there still is much, a, a long way to go, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. Male circumcision is now emerging as a major biomedical intervention. Uh, recent studies have shown that um, male, uh, men who are circumcised have a 33% reduction in their risk of acquiring HIV as compared to uncircumcised males. This has now led to several countries in sub-Saharan Africa now mounting countrywide mass campaigns to have all adult men and adolescent men circumcised. Um, and, uh, uh, but again, this is only a benefit for, for men who are circumcised. There's no evidence that there's a, an, a, an effect on uh, their female partners or male partners having a decreased risk. Um, certainly need to address and continue to increase the standards for the quality of, of and safety of blood for transfusion. There is also increased movement for using antiretroviral therapy as an HIV prevention um, uh, strategy. And, um, uh, and this is, um, uh, you know, looking at getting people on who are H getting people tested and those who are HIV positive to get them on antiretroviral medication earlier rather than later. Um, and in fact, Washington D.C. is going to be one of the first major cities that's going to pilot doing a massive HIV testing, and and will and then will treat anyone who is HIV positive, irregardless of their CD4 count or other clinical signs. And the idea here is that reducing viral load will reduce the, tr the, the, uh, the chance of transmission to another individual. Um, of course, injection safety and, and using syringes in the healthcare setting and detection of, uh, and treatment of uh, sexually transmitted diseases, you know, really compile you know, a, a, a list here of potential biomedical interventions. Then there's a, a, a menu of selections of behavioral interventions ranging from promoting consistent and correct condom use, delaying sexual debut, getting HIV tested to know your status, counseling serodiscordant couples, um, which are couples where one is HIV positive and one is HIV negative, and for the most part, uh, they don't know each other's status. Uh, reducing drug and alcohol use as a risk factor that leads to risky behavior. Of course, promoting abstinence and helping to reduce the number of concurrent partners. Structural interventions are many, and these are usually done at an institutional community or national level through policy and regulations. Um, and some are very broad in trying to address gender inequities and, and the, the fact that girls are, and, and women are proportionally at risk to HIV, addressing the unique characteristics of a, and risk of a migrant population, providing for economic empowerment, mass and education campaigns that can be supported by the government, Increasing alcohol taxes as a means of reducing alcohol consumption among, among youth and young people. Increasing condom availability, and it's quite amazing. Uh, in a number of settings in Sub-Saharan Africa, condoms just aren't even available in the quantities that are needed. Even though you're educating the heck out of young people, the condoms are not there uh, for their use. Uh, reducing sexual and domestic violence, and of course addressing HIV stigma and discrimination. Now I'd like to turn to a partnership for an HIV-free generation. As Randy mentioned, I'm the global executive director of this new partnership, and I'm doing that in my role um, as an employee of, of EPCO Worldwide. And this is an exciting partnership that is directed at youth prevention in sub-Saharan Africa. So what is it? 
This is a partnership involving the U.S. government um, and through its PEPFAR program and the Office of the Global AIDS Coordinator in the State Department and 20 private sector partners. And together we form the Partnership for an HIV-Free Generation. The idea behind this partnership actually came from the former head of PEPFAR, Ambassador Mark Deibel. And uh, I think frustrated by the, uh, the lack of real progress on HIV prevention and, uh, and how to increase the effectiveness um, and the reach of HIV prevention, particularly among youth. And I think it was Ambassador Deibel's wish that you know, U.S. government funding be put to as good use for prevention as it was for providing access to antiretroviral medications in sub-Saharan Africa. And he also felt that the private sector, uh, whether it's for businesses or large international organizations, have unique sets of tools and technologies and core competencies of reaching out to youth. And how can we tap into that type of core competency to make HIV prevention better? So who are these partners? It now ranges some 20 partners. And the, uh, the partners range from uh, large, iconic, multinational companies uh, with names such as Warner Brothers, Coca-Cola, Nike, Intel, Microsoft, Procter & Gamble, and Hasbro. It's also international organizations um, such as Girl Scouts, uh, Girl Scouts and Girl Guides, Junior Achievement, and Rotarians. Um, the businesses such as Nike, Coca-Cola, and Warner Brothers have unique competencies in reaching out to young people, changing their behavior, which is their buying behavior, and getting them to buy into a lifestyle represented by that brand, whether it's the swoosh for Nike or playing video games developed by Warner Brothers. Organizations such as the Rotarians um, and Junior Achievement can provide for life skills training, job training, entrepreneurship to help build economic opportunities for young people and give them an alternative uh, to their lifestyle that might put them at risk to HIV and give them hope for a future. So this partnership together will utilize the core competencies of the private sector to attract and reach the hearts and minds of young people. It will design prevention strategies in concert with public health experts uh, to, that will be informed by the local epidemic, no matter what country this partnership is operating, and be informed by the cultural context in which youth are living. It will build upon and use community and youth assets uh, that are already in place to help build ownership and sustainability. There is enormous amount of, 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 of little health service centers um, in churches and other youth organizations uh, that can be tapped into and that really are really, it's really an untapped potential uh, in helping to connect and provide services to youth. And through all of this, we want to create hope for a young person that they do have a future that's worth living free of HIV. So how does this work? So we have this partnership for an HIV-free generation that involves the public sector, which is primarily government. That could be US government or the government of the country where our partnership is operating. What the pub pub public sector brings to the table, they determine the priorities for HIV prevention. They can help mobilize public health experts. And they do provide the major source of funding for HIV prevention. Um, in, uh, in countries. Then you have the private sector, whether it's the businesses or organizations like Junior Achievement. They bring marketing competence in reaching youth. They also bring lifestyle brand building and, uh, and attract people to be part of an, a lifestyle brand. They bring economic opportunities and the tools and technologies, their core competencies as businesses. And finally, we work with civil society. And these are going to be organizations on the ground, whether the NGOs, faith-based organizations, community organizations, youth organizations. They have the on-the-ground resources and assets, implementation experience, and provide that nexus for youth engagement uh, that will be so critical in success of this program. Importantly, um, 
the Partnership for an HIV-Free Generation does not operate in a vacuum, does not have a standalone program. The partnership, since it is part and a par partnership with the U.S. PEPFAR uh, AIDS program, our partnership is sits within the whole PEPFAR strategy, prevention strategy that PEPFAR has, whether at a global level or tailored to individual country level. And importantly, the PEPFAR strategy also is in alignment with a host country or target country program, whether it's in Tanzania or Kenya or South Africa. Again, this follows the principles that we need to support the country's priorities, because at the end of the day, it's going to be that country and that country's government in the long term that's going to be responsible uh, for addressing HIV AIDS, whether it's on treatment or whether it's on prevention. The goal for this partnership is lofty, and that is we aim for a 50% reduction in HIV incidence in youth in sub-Saharan Africa age 15 to 24 over five years. And by, by sub-Saharan Africa, I mean in, in the areas where this program is operating. It is a lofty goal, uh, but from meetings I have attended over this past year, it's a goal that other public health experts in the HIV AIDS prevention world are also quoting for themselves. So I do think that this is achievable. And we'll do this through defining youth-focused interventions through developing a youth resonating, unifying brand, an iconic lifestyle brand they'll be attracted to and want to be part of. And through this, we'll be able to help increase their knowledge about HIV and their own understanding of their own risk, provide access to health services, social services, the education, life skills training, and economic opportunities that will give them a, 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 give them a future. There will be a special focus on girls and women because of their disproportionate vulnerabilities to HIV. And it will also help in partnership to address violence issues, drug use, and alcohol consumption as major risk drivers. So where do we start this partnership? Actually, we started the partnership in Kenya. The partnership was launched a year ago uh, in Nairobi. Um, and uh, it was launched with a massive youth concert uh, bringing together art, uh, you know, musical artists and, um, and bringing together uh, organizations that provided for HIV testing on site. I think the concert attracted some 45,000 people. Uh, it was the largest non-political gathering in Kenya's history. And it was a, a resounding success. So why did we start in Kenya? Obviously, there's many countries for which we could have chosen. First, in Kenya, the problem indeed is real. HIV prevalence is about 7.1%, with over 8% in women, uh, a little over 5% in men. In youth, 15 to 24 years old, prevalence is nearly 4%. Women in the 15 to 24 year old range in Kenya, the, it's, the prevalence of HIV is four times higher than men. Uncircumcised men are, have a, a prevalence of HIV that's three times greater than um, than circumcised men. There are regional variances of prevalence in Kenya ranging from 1 to 15 percent depending on where you are in the country. But interestingly, um, you know, 7 out of 10 infected youth and adults are in rural areas of Kenya, which does create even an additional challenge uh, to be able to reach out, not, reach not only to the urban concentrated population centers, but also to rural areas. And the need in Kenya is large. Two-thirds of people in Kenya have never been tested for HIV. Half believe they're at low risk. 84% of HIV-infected adults do not know their status. About 80% have no knowledge of their partner status. 45% of married HIV-infected persons have an uninfected partner, a discordant couple. When you look at condom use, among non-married uh, individuals in non-married relationships, 36-53% report using condoms consistently. But among married couples, less than 5% use condoms. Link that back to 45% of married HIV-infected persons have an uninfected partner. And those are the couples that are not using condoms which has, met, has, has some to 
um, you know, to assert that marriage actually is a risk factor for HIV. And you think about the ABCs that we have been promoting, abstinence, be faithful, wear a condom. Yes, you can be faithful, but fa being faithful only works if, if you are, you know, either, either have an uninfected partner or if that person is infected, you need to know that and you need to protect yourself. And finally in Kenya, 20% um, of young people have sex by the time they're 15 years old. But hope exists in Kenya. There is a very strong civil society, community-based organizations, and NGOs, and, and uh, faith-based organizations. And there's a very strong spirit of volunteerism. Uh, and I witnessed this when I was in Kenya uh, with our partnership uh, in October, meeting with groups of girls and boys. And they really want to help their communities uh, address, and their friends address the issues of HIV. And finally, there's a private sector that is very highly motivated and driven to be part of the aid, HIV AIDS solution and HIV prevention among youth. And this is not only these large iconic companies, but also Kenya-based companies, uh, such as uh, Mikado Safaris and uh, Safaricom. Um, and so you know, pulling all of this together, I think we have great hope to make an impact on HIV among youth in Kenya. And then capping it all together, 70% of Kenya's population is under 25 years old. The peak of HIV infection is 30 to 34 age, age range. And with 20% of youth having their sexual debut before the age of 15. We put this all together and we do believe that youth HIV prevention rocks. Or put it the other way, we must make HIV prevention rock for youth. And that's what our partnership is trying to do. We will reach out to Kenya youth through some of the traditional, traditional means, through behavior change communications, access to health services and education. But it's also going to be providing those economic opportunities, such as Rotarians and Junior Achievement can help. Um, uh, attracting youth with music and entertainment that then will then link them to HIV education. Merchandising through a lifestyle brand. Information technology and use of cell phones and text messages. Attracting youth through sports as well as promoting and rewarding youth leadership. Now we talk about the Partnership for an HIV-Free Generation and US government, PEPFAR, 20 you know, private sector partners all put together. We have to make it relevant for youth. But HIV-Free HIV Generation is really our corporate brand or our global brand. Um, it's a global partnership. It represents the vision for the partnership it's probably not going to resonate with youth very well because that's the old way of doing things, which is really kind of HIV in your face, don't do this, don't do that. We want to have, turn this around and make it very positive. And so in Kenya, as we will with other countries as we expand, we created a specific brand uh, for Kenya, which is called Japange. And Japange is a play on the uh, Swahili word, which actually starts uh, J-I, Pange, uh, which loosely translates into get your life together, get your act together, get your house in order. And it's kind of a call to youth to you know, get themselves together. And this is the unifying lifestyle brand that we are going to promote in Kenya. Programs in, uh, that the, uh, the uh, private sector partners will support with PEPFAR and other implementing partners on the ground will have their programs branded with Japange. Um, and may or may not use HIV free generation because this is about using brands that's going to you know, resonate with young people. And then there will be a portfolio of Japange branded programs um, that uh, will be in three broad categories of multimedia, um, youth sites, which we have, are calling G bases, you know, again using the Japange uh, 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 route, and outreach programs. There are also principles for a Japange lifestyle associated with this brand. There are five. And one is Jikinge, which means play safe in Swahili. Jijue Hale Yaku is know your HIV status. Jifahama Mishe is know your sexual health. Jiamini, believe in yourself. And Jiinyue, plan for your future. 
And so you'll see with this, the principles of a Japungi lifestyle, there's really, of these principles, there's only one that is directly about HIV. But the rest is about an entire holistic approach to a youth's life and their future. Um, and for each of these principles are incorporated or might be a particular component of a project uh, that would be underway under this partnership. And so the portfolio of programs includes multimedia, which will be TV, print, radio, um, outdoor uh, you know, uh, advertising, cell phones, and, and internet. Again, depending upon where the youth are and their capabilities. Then we have the youth centers or the G bases um, that may be a G base could be a, a, uh, a, a center that has access and referrals to, to, um, to health services uh, and also economic opportunities and perhaps games and sports. Um, but these could be youth centers that might be housed at local NGOs, schools, churches, and health facilities or can merely be a kiosk uh, in the slum. And, and finally, the, the third broad category of the Chapungay portfolio programs is outreach. And that's taking this Chapungay brand and lifestyle and going out into the community where youth are and bringing that brand along. And that generally is involving community rallies, sports, music, and entertainment. And by capturing the attention of youth with of things they like to do, then you can connect them uh, to the education and services that they need and reach out to them in a very targeted way. Now in the multimedia category, there's a number of programs that are underway. Um, we're working with MTV Staying Alive campaign uh, and doing a, a, a major media campaign, a specific uh, a television program. Jujue One Million is a big multimedia campaign that is aiming to get one million Kenya youth uh, tested for HIV over the next year. And there are other uh, interventions with HIV-free generation in Kenya that will be planned. With the youth sites or G bases where you, young people can come and hang out, there will be a multitude of activities. There's one, a uh, couple of G bases already underway. This one is the G base Makuru in the Makuru slum. And there, PEPFAR through the um, uh, PEPFAR funding programs, there will be a comprehensive um, selection of youth services, youth friendly services, um, you know, for young people. A video game developed by Warner Brothers will be there for young people to come in to play. Microsoft and Intel are working, are working together to provide um, access to computers and skill trainings through computer clubhouses and, and uh, Microsoft's Opportunity Box, which not only will teach young people their computer skills, um, but will also generate economic opportunities for them related to computer technologies and how they can build businesses from having that knowledge. Rotarians will bring in those from the business community to serve as mentors for young people. And Nike Foundation and TechnoServe are partnering to teach entrepreneurial skills to young women, and that will serve as an activity associated with one of these G bases. Outreach programs are several that are underway, working and to attract youth with soccer through grassroots soccer. Um, we're also reaching out to employers who are already employing young people and delivering um, health services and HIV education in the workplace. We're doing a twinning program between the Kenya Girl Scouts Girl Guides and Girl Scouts USA, again on HIV prevention and health messaging. Um, Makato Safaris is working with um, you know, young people um, and, uh, to, on a program that actually delivers packages and of, 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 of materials for young girls to bring the sanitary napkins, as well as HIV education materials, puberty education materials. And these packages are delivered to schools uh, for all the girls on a semester, you know, one time each semester. At the same time, it's an income generating project because we're also teaching young women to, how to make these reusable sanitary napkins and the whole package. Um, and so this is a very integrated approach to addressing the needs of young girls. Junior Achievement is reaching out to youth in school to provide for job skills training. And there are also annual talent competitions that will be uh, organized, as a, again, as a means of outreach to young people in the communities. 
Now I'd like to show you two examples of contributions that have been made by our private sector uh, partners. And I think we need to start to lower the lights. Uh, the first one is a video game developed by Warner Brothers. This is actually a co-investment between PEPFAR and Warner Brothers. Uh, it was a project that took about 12 to 18 months to bring together. And uh, Warner Brothers developed this video game uh, called Pomoja Mtani, which means Together in the Hood. And this video game is to be fun and interactive for young people, and it's targeted for ages 15 to 19, both boys and girls. And it's based on situation-based decision-making. Um, and in this video, um, the, as you play the video, you need to take on one of the roles of five different characters who are brought together when their Matatu bus is hijacked. And then they are, they are faced with situations that have them make decisions that are related to HIV risk. And um, the, uh, the messaging that is embedded within this video game, which is now is tested among you prior to playing the game and then after playing the game, is the messages around delay in sex, reducing concurrent number of concurrent sexual partners, increasing condom use, getting HIV tested, and encouraging secondary ab abstinence which means that even if you've already had sex, you can actually begin to abstain again. And um, when Warner Brothers put this together, they put the A team at Warner Brothers Emerging Technologies together to develop this video game. Warner Brothers developed and used technology for this video game they had never used before. Uh, the Warner Brothers team was, uh, of the creative people were so excited to be able to contribute to this. Warner Brothers sent their team out to the Makuru slum in Nairobi uh, in order to um, develop scenes in the video game that look like the Makuru slum. And the idea being is to bring to you their neighborhood so they have that connection and then can then get into the game and start to, um, you know, and start to absorb some of these messages, even of those subliminally. Um, so we'll begin, and I'll, this is what this you'll see here. It's not the playing the game itself, but it's a trailer that Warner Brothers put together for promotional purposes. And if I'm promotional, I mean for you know audience such as yourself, so you can kind of get an idea of what this game and what this game is about. The next clip I'll show you is from MTV Staying Alive. Um, many of you may be aware of uh, MTV Staying Alive program, which has been underway uh, since 1998. Uh, I think one of the largest um, uh, you know, mass media campaigns for HIV uh, prevention and awareness of its kind in the world. So we're very lucky that MTV has partnered with HIV Free Generation. And what they have done is developed a a basically kind of a soap series uh, that is uh, focused on uh, uh, to, to youth uh, on HIV prevention. And uh, the series is called Sugar. 
And uh, this actually was um, launched over the last month or so uh, in Nairobi with some uh, initial screenings with uh, young people. And it's been a smashing success. And uh, so this will continue in a series. And when I was in Kenya just a couple of, of weeks ago, we were able to meet with the actors and actresses uh, that are appearing in this, um, uh, will be appearing in this series. So again, I'll just show you a brief clip to give you a glimpse of what sugar is all about. But they love each other. No, sweetie. Love is a trap. <laughs> yeah, it's Hurahi Day nights. Music, vibes, sweat and sex in the air. Tini story of my boy, wa gear five. My day more fly. Kutere msha zip kwa fly. <laughs> this is a story of true love, lost, broken trust. Story of my bright lives, entwining and colliding. <laughs> Oh, our choices. I think Vanya was positive. No way. You guy, but she's so hot. I woke up in her bed. I found an HIV pamphlet on the mirror. Can you didn't use a condom? Yeah, see, that's the thing. Jana's like a blah. I was drunk. I vibe. It's your life, man. I'm done being your babysitter. Last night was a mistake. You're damn right it was a mistake. You ruined my life. <laughs> Merit and he's funny and he comes from a very good family. Money is not a condom. So what do you do when the party catches up with you? Has the ride been worth it? Did you know that your SLK slips out of the garage when you're not looking, huh? Mm -hmm. Ty! 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 I'm sorry! Tiny story I'm going after my bye bye, my dies, my door door sugu, zimeachua. Maybe someday I'm gonna make it through. So that's our partnership for an HIV free generation. And you know, we will continue to build this partnership. It's launched in Nairobi, uh, we, uh, in Kenya. Uh, we intend to expand the partnership to other countries in sub-Saharan Africa over the next, uh, next couple of years. But we'll continue to base, on, base our partnerships on, on principles and framework. Um, one is that the public sector, whether it's the US government or national governments, through their research, increase our, our understanding of the epidemic of HIV AIDS in a particular country context and what public health strategies are going to be needed to protect young people from, from HIV. And HIV must, prevention must be in combination, multifaceted, and targeted to youth uh, with a combination of biomedical, behavioral, and structural interventions. And it has to target youth where they are and where they want to be and who they are and who they want to be. And youth leadership and partnership and engagement is critical to the success of this partnership. From the beginning, we, we involved youth in developing the, the, the brand of Japange to the principles of a Japange lifestyle, as well as to design and the implementation of programs. And that is going to be absolutely vital. And finally, I hope you can see the private sector, you know, whether it's the iconic businesses like a Warner Brothers or Coca-Cola or large even nonprofit organizations, Junior Achievement, or you know, MTV, uh, can bring the kind of innovation that's needed for HIV prevention, lifestyle branding, and that marketing savvy that can help win these hearts and minds of young people, and help shape um, and and uh, help shape and as well as change behaviors toward uh, uh, reducing their risk of HIV. <coughs> 
So that's our partnership for an HIV-free generation. And um, you know, interesting, on my way today uh, to uh, the university on I-26 uh, marker 42, mile marker 42, there was a church on the side of the road, and it had, a, it had printed on the, si on the church side so you could see it from the highway. It says, where there is no vision, people perish. And I'd like to think that where there's no vision of the possibilities of what we can do for HIV prevention, that indeed our youth and communities and families will continue to perish. Um, and I, I certainly believe in the partners uh, you know, involved in this partnership from the U.S. government and the 20 plus companies and organizations really do believe in the power of public-private partnerships and that we can help create a future for youth that will be free of HIV and help them make the right kind of decisions and choices that will protect themselves and their families and future generations to come. So I hope you found this informative and, uh, and perhaps even inspirational. Um, and as there still is a lot of work to do with the partnerships. They're not easy, as, as Randy said, and particularly when you've got U.S. government in Washington, in Kenya, more countries to come, 20 private sector partners, civil society, and youth engagement. Uh, but we're all very determined. And, uh, and so it's with, uh, I think, the help of many that uh, we really do feel that we can achieve that vision of an HIV-free generation. Um, so thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to take any comments or questions about the partnership, HIV prevention, uh, and our other aspects of, uh, of HIV or my work. Thank you. Questions? Just say who you are. So we'll... My name's Bob Punch. Um, I didn't see any product placement in, in what you were showing. <laughs> How do you entice the, the privates to be involved in this? Did they do this out of their marketing budgets, or is it strictly from their foundations? Yeah, um, that's a very interesting question. Um, first of all, I think this, it's, uh, there's a couple aspects. If you notice, of all the partners we have, none are healthcare companies. And, um, and, and again, it, it, it it goes back to the original vision that you know Ambassador Mark Dybel had is that is, you know, it's not about products. It it it, it really what we need from the private sector um, is the core competencies of, of being able to re to reach out to you. Now, for individual companies, whether it's a Nike or Intel or Warner Brothers, um, I, I think it's twofold. Um, one and and I said and Pepfar is very. Uh, uh, and, and, and the government officials are very upfront about this. They want to see that the that companies see in the end that there is a you know there is a commercial benefit, a, a good good for business. And and you know when it's you look at countries like Kenya uh, and other countries in sub-Saharan Africa where there is you know great potential for a a a, a larger you know consumer market. Um, and the, the, certainly the the growth of young people in the sector and the workforce there. You know, there is a business interest in being able to have a presence and, and through this have an experience base in these countries. Uh, but in addition, a number of these organiz uh, number of the, the companies and organizations such as Junior Achievement have had um, programs around HIV AIDS or youth or, um, or uh, in, in some countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. So this is about kind of putting it together under one umbrella of HIV free generation. And together, you know, focusing and saturating, you know, whether now it's in Nairobi uh, or, um, you know, could be in Haberoni, Botswana, you know, for the expansion. Um, and uh, so I think it's a combination of all of that. And I've said, I also want to add, too, is, you know, what the, uh, again, what the government was looking for from the uh, initial set of partners, and all of these partners were very, like I said, they were handpicked by the U.S. government by, the types of tools, technologies, and core competencies these organizations had that they felt would be useful for HIV. What the government wasn't looking for from these, these organizations was money. Because uh, PEPFAR has money. I mean, they're spending you know, $6 billion on HIV. That's not the issue. The issue is that we just don't, even with the money, we just don't know really how to reach out to youth. And that's why the US government engaged with these partners. Good evening. My name is Dumisa Shamoya. I'm a first-year public health student. 
Um, as you ventured into the sub-Saharan African country of Kenya and others, I'm sure you found a good number of interventions that have been previously done. In your opinion and experience, how strong is the evaluation component of these interventions and how much of their data influenced your choice of interventions? Yes. Yeah. Well, first of all, I think, you know, as opposed to, you know, say treatment um, uh, and, uh, and or some of the biomedical interventions, I think a lot of data is lacking in validating, you know, um, many of the approaches that have been used on HIV prevention. Um, but that being said, you know, I think, you know, there's some kind of like basic tenets that you know need to be done on, um, um, say, behavior change communications. Um, and, you know, some of the, the, the major areas of focus is, is around, you know, condom use, reducing um, uh, number of concurrent partners, and particularly addressing the issues around discordant couples. Um, but our, our, you know, in Kenya, and as it will be in other countries in the future, uh, we really, you know, depend upon and defer to the public health experts, you know, that are sitting within U.S. government or with implementing organizations that have long time worked in this field, you know, whether it's Family Health International or PSI um, and, um, or in faith-based organizations. And so, you know, what we look at is at an individual country and in the context of youth, what's going to be um, either, you know, based on empirical evidence or, you know, based on, you know, really a, a probably a good-hearted assumption, you know, is to put together that package of HIV prevention interventions for youth. Um, but we also hope through this partnership that um, we can, in, you know, help contribute to, uh, to this data to show what works and what doesn't. And one big question is, is this whole aspect of economic empowerment. Um, we believe that that will have an impact, but we don't know. And as it turns out, nobody else knows either of whether or not if you give young people job skills training, um, uh, you know, uh, training and entrepreneurship, and they're able to generate you know, their you know, income that's not related to sex and drugs, Will that indeed, at the end, reduce HIV? And we don't know that. Uh, you'd like to think that kind of inherently makes sense, but we need to show. And, and with the emphasis on the economic empowerment in our program, we hope that we'll be able to contribute to that body of knowledge. My name is Uchenna Agenti, um, a DRPH student in the um, Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics. I'm just curious to know, I was amazed when I heard you had a PhD in environmental health, and um, <laughs> I'm curious to know how you came from environmental health and how you have ended up in this position and what skills you would had um, from environmental health that played a role in your current position. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, it was a... a, a, a unpredictable path, I would have to say. Uh, yes, my degree was environmental health, and actually my undergraduate degree is in medical technology, so I kind of had that, that, that kind of, you know, leaning. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, in environmental health, I focused on, I had a, fo a specialty in toxicology, and then I studied um, molecular toxicology and, and uh, drug metabolism. And, but the, the key thing is then I joined Merck, uh, the drug company, and uh, and I was at Merck for 23 years. 20 years of that I was involved in HIV AIDS because I was helping to support I, the communications, um, the public policy, uh, issues management, community relations so in support of Merck's AIDS research program that resulted in several antiretroviral drugs um, as well as a continued pursuit for an HIV vaccine. So that's how I got involved in HIV AIDS. And then things just snowballed you know, through partnerships with the Gates Foundation in Botswana uh, uh, and for HIV, uh, you know, prevention, care, and treatment in Botswana, started a similar public-private partnership with the government of China and Merck, and now kind of turning to prevention. So um, it's just been a real privilege uh, to be able to feel that I've really been on, you know, the forefront of HIV, you know, uh, over these years. Good evening. My name is Kirsten Hutchinson, and... Um, 
Actually, I would like to make a comment more than a question, and that is I'd like to say thank you very much for what you are doing. I have been working the last 10 years in a rural mission hospital in Zimbabwe, and I have been facing exactly all of these issues where probably 30% uh, of the general population has HIV, 70 to 60, 60 to 70% of my hospital population has HIV, and then it's through Global Fund that we were one of the first five hospitals to start issuing, to giving ARVs out in our country, and we have 2,500 patients on them now. Wow. And you're exactly, you've hit the nail on the head when you um, are now turning towards prevention. I've been thinking that myself for a long time, happy for the interventions, but waiting for the prevention. Yeah. And also, um, I'd like to thank you for keying in on culturally appropriate methods, because we as Americans are very ethnocentric and we think we know what is right. Yeah. Um, but to have the truth but to not be able to convey it in a culturally appropriate uh, way is actually not very useful. And so yeah. I thank you very much for the work that you're doing. I thank you for uh, being culturally sensitive and thank you for changing the, um, or at least beginning to make that change to the focus on prevention. So thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, my name is uh, Hadi Mamudu. Uh, in your framework, uh, you mentioned uh, civil society, you mentioned government, and of course you mentioned uh, the private sector. But what was missing was uh, the intergovernmental sector like uh, the UN, uh, UNDP, UNESCO, and those kind of uh, mm -hmm. organizations who are also working in the field as well. So uh, can you explain how this work in collaboration with them or in parallel to them, uh, so that you guys will avoid uh, the issue of uh, duplication right. over some of these uh, issues. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. That's a good. Uh, that's a, a good question. Um, I would say that in the formative stages of this partnership over the last year or so, that um, you know we have not, um, you know engaged as much as we will in the future. Uh, the other, part, the other um, organizations, as you noted, um, uh, from the UN family. And I think this you know, evolves from this initially, and it was you know, in, in its inception, was a US PEPFAR public-private partnership. And, and I think that there probably hasn't been uh, in many cases, that level of collaboration outside of this partnership with the PEPFAR funded programs in country and those that funded by Global Fund or World Bank and others. That is changing in the PEPFAR mindset. Um, there is a new um, you know, head of the PEPFAR program, uh, Ambassador Eric Goosby. And, um, he, he is bringing, uh, I can, we'll take PEPFAR into the kind of the, the next level. And what that will entail is PEPFAR working and, and building, helping to build capacity in the government so that they're, let's say government, say in this case Kenya, that they're better able, Kenya government is better able to bring together and have those collaborations and cross-fertilization among all of the development partners that are in the on the ground, whether it's PEPFAR funded, Global Fund funded, DFID funded, Gates Foundation funded. And some countries that's worked w uh, better than others, but I think that's going to be more now of a mantra of PEPFAR, that it, can, you know, it needs to work you know, in concert and you know, knitted with you know, other, you know, development, uh, development agency uh, work on the ground. Hello, I'm Vera. I'm a doctoral student in public health. I recently read the new WHO recommendations on prevention and treatment of HIV, and the report actually promotes breastfeeding among women who are on ART. Yeah. And uh, I was just wondering what is the thinking behind that? Is it the transmission, is the transmission risk low or is it alternates of breastfeeding inaccessible in developing countries yeah. or something else? Yeah. 
Well, that's certainly an area that I'm not uh, an expert in. Um, I know that there are, you know, certainly there are there's differences of views and controversies of whether or not to promote breastfeeding among HIV positive women. In this case, those are an antiretroviral therapy. And I guess the tension is, you know, here you have a child who already is in a circumstance to be malnourished and then not to be breastfed just kind of it confounds that situation. And then are you taking a calculated risk by reducing, um, you know, the, the mother's viral load with aggressive antiretroviral therapy um, and then, uh, and, you know, and then allowing her to breastfeed her child to the health of the child. And so, again, that's, a, again, a calculated risk. But, again, that's an area that I'm not that expert in right now and, and really not, um, you know, fully apprised of the, the WHO recommendations. I did note that WHO treatment guidelines were just changed, too. And, um, you know, uh, and now they're re recommending treatment with antiretrovirals. I think once CD4 counts drop below 350 rather than 200. Well, the rest of the world has already been up to 350 and, and 500, and now... As I mentioned, more of a movement toward get tested, you're HIV positive, get on antiretrovirals, you know, immediately. So. Well, Linda, thank you. Let's another round of applause, please. For okay. Linda. Thank you. Uh, now, Distelrath is actually the, the first person in our series to do two complete presentations as a leading voice and public health lecturer. And when she left the last time, we gave her an adjunct faculty appointment. And she recognized that that only lasted two years, so she <laughs> came back. And, but tonight, we're going to go one step uh, better than that. And name you an honorary professor in the College oh of Public God. Health. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, now I'm that very means, honored. That means you have to come back every year now. Okay, <laughs> okay I'll do that. <laughs> um, we also have a few other parting gifts. I know we gave you the Encyclopedia of Appalachia oh. last time, so this time we have a, a visual concert with photographs and music oh, as well. Oh, wow. As a portfolio for Thank you. you. And um, a, few other, a few other parting gifts. Um, but thank you. Thank you so much. And um, I will announce the next lecture later on. Look at your emails. Um, we do have a pretty exciting series for next year. I've got April and March lined up, but I don't have January yet, so I don't like to jinx myself by saying anything just yet. But hopefully um, you all will come back. Thank you for being here tonight. And Linda, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your time.